I've been reading about bulk bind and array fetch or batch fetching. That's I'll read it in situ. But the demos are all about building programs, I assume, from scratch. We have complex existing code that is row by row, but I can't get my head around how to rewrite it all to use bulk batch. Just to fix up the nomenclature here, uh, we're talking about bulk binding to get you know, DML performance benefits and bulk collect to get array processing fetching benefits to get that benefit of pinning and less latching. Now, I will say, even though the question said, how do we rewrite it all? I'm not a fan of rewrite generally of code. And the reason is the risk profile is just too high. Uh, anyone remember Netscape? Netscape, the browser, decided to rewrite the, their product. And where are they now? They just took too long. And this is, a, on a smaller scale, a similar problem. If you can commit to rewriting your product, generally by the time it's rewritten, you've got not just the existing bugs you have to fix, you've got a whole plethora of new bugs that you have to fix and new testing. It's hard to justify that kind of investment. I'm a big fan of if you have a piece of code that you're unhappy with, <laughs> What you do is you chip away at it, making improvements with minimal risk and still try to get as many benefits as possible. So I thought I would demonstrate that tonight just to prove that bulk binding, et cetera, isn't sort of uh, in the domain solely of writing programs from scratch. So this is my fictitious scenario. We've got a, a you know, customer products and sales kind of environment here. And for each, this is the, the requirement that's coming. For each product and then for each customer, Process the sales that are less than a quantity of four. Call the discount web service to validate the details. And if valid, the valid thing comes back as true, then log that sales row in the sales load table for later checks. So this is my fictitious, complicated application. So let's build it. Let's, let's build it effectively as bad, and then we'll see if we can improve it by chipping away at it. So as I said, we're going to have some products, some customers, and sales. So I've got some products. I've got a thousand, a hundred different products. I've got a thousand different customers, and my sales table is just grabbing random product IDs, random customer IDs, and then blaming them into the sales table, which consists of products, customers, a timestamp, an amount, and a price. You can see the amount goes from zero to nine because it's just simple modulo. So our requirement was go get you know these particular rows that had an amount less than four, and so we're going to build a row by row style application that does this job for us people watching this going that sounds like i do it with a single sql and and we'll get to that but let's build an application first and then see how we chip it away without needing to rewrite it to get all the benefits that we still would like to get so i put an index on the sales table and i'm going to need a sales load table this is where my uh, bad rows are going to get logged into and because i've got a table i'm probably going to have a little api that sits on the billet to actually log it so if I need to log a row in this sales low, low table, I'll call this API, log a low sale, pass in the entire row as a row type variable, log it and commit it, and there's my little API. The original spec was for each customer, for each product, loop through the sales. And this is that common mistake we make. We read a module spec and we build it as per spec. So the spec said for each product that comes in and for each customer that comes in, loop through all the sales for that combination, Fine with the amount is less than four. And if it's less than four, call my very complicated web service, which might you know, in Java goes out to the external environment, et cetera. Spoiler alert, this is just a Boolean that returns true uh, for this particular demo. And if it returns true, then log a row, call that API we just built. So there's our little application, a little API called find the low sales. Now we need to do this for every single product and customer. So I'll set this one running. This is the row by row and the slowest of the um, code that we'll hopefully see tonight. But just while it's running, we'll walk through it. We have a cursor, which is the list of all the products. We have a cursor, which is a list of all the customers. So what I'll do is I'll open that one first, and I'm doing, as our uh, poster said, we're doing single row processing. So we're fetching a product list and exiting when not found. Now that we've got our first product, we go get the customers, go get each customer for those. And now that we have a customer product pairing, I call it into that previous routine. For a given product and customer, find all the low sales, and for everyone I find, call the next API to log it in the sales table. And then I loop around and close my cursors. It took about 33 seconds. And so this is my hopefully reasonable example of an application that's been built based on various APIs. And because we're reusing APIs, we've ended up with a row by row, or as my friend Tom Kite used to say, slow by slow program. It's 33 seconds, how do we make it better?
So the first thing I'll do in terms of when you just want to chip away at things without making too much risk, the first thing I'm going to do is how often do we commit? This is one of the most common performance tuning fixes I'll help people out with. We have this mindset of, ah, oh, because I need to restart something, and I'll talk about that in a second, uh, I'm going to commit every single row. So the first thing I'm generally going to do is I'm simply going to look for where commits are and see if I can remove them. So I've just commented that out. And then I simply rerun that same routine. It took, what, 35 seconds the first time? Simply by taking out the commits and deferring it to the very end, we'll see if we get any improvements. And we've gone from 33 seconds, or 34 seconds was it, down to 13 seconds. And even though these are very short demos, that's not to be understated. That's literally getting two and a half to three times performance benefit. Generally, if you go replace your server with brand new hardware, you might get 10% performance benefit. And this is getting 300% benefit. So looking for removing of commits where possible is a really good idea. And I put in the myth of restart. Often when I suggest this to people, they go, oh no, we can't, we commit every single row because that means if something fails halfway through, we've got some of the work done. I'm absolutely amazed at the amount of times that people think by committing every single row, they've actually made their job easier when it comes to resolving errors after a failure. Generally, you've made things much, much worse. Because for example, with this application here, by committing every single row, I could never run this again. It doesn't, it's not restartable because it simply loops through all the customers and products. The moment you start having intermittent commits in your code, you've actually increased the complexity dramatically in terms of being able to restart it because now you need to be able to log where you're up to because every time you run the code, it needs to say, ah, oh, have I completed 30% of the task? If so, I need to start at step 31 onwards. This code doesn't have that facility. And so I call this the myth of restartability. The more commits you have in your application, the less restartable it is. One commit at the end is generally better. But let's assume, let's assume they have some facility yeah, better than this, where no matter how many they've committed, the next time they run it, it will pick up from where it left off. Can you still get some benefits? Yes. One of the common things I'll do is if you want to make sure you commit only at certain intervals, but you don't really know how long does it take to process each product, each customer. If I put a commit at the end of each loop, is that gonna be every second, every minute, every millisecond? Well, we can control it ourselves. I create a little package called, called package here called commit every, and it says procedure five seconds. No prizes for guessing how, how frequently I plan on committing here. And to do that, all I have to do is store a little package variable. I've got last commit date, it's this date because dates contain times as well. And all I do is every time, if more than five seconds has elapsed, then I'll actually do a real commit and record this last commit time. So what this means is if every time I call this package, I'll do a pseudo commit. I'll say, yep, I've done a commit, but I actually only do a real commit every five seconds. So once again, in terms of just chipping away at code with minimal risk, rather than comment out the commit, I simply replace the commit call with commit every five seconds. And we can set our code running again. And what this will do is the code looks identical. I still need this trailing commit at the end here, just in case I finished, let's say three seconds through. But now assuming I've got all the restartability logic in there, which this one doesn't, then I'm going to commit every five seconds. No more frequent. I could have put commits at the end of each of these loops, but I then don't really know how often I'm committing. But in this case, I'm committing at, at most every five seconds, and I'm still down around that 13 second mark, 15 seconds, a little bit more time, but still I'm a lot faster than the original code. So that takes care of commits. The second thing is the easiest way to get array processing on read is simply to use implicit cursors. I've lost track of the number of coding standard documents that say all cursors must be defined as explicit cursors, and then you must do open, fetch, et cetera, et cetera. I have no problems with having explicit cursors. I generally don't use them, but if you need, if you want to have them in there for documentation purposes, fine. But whenever you're looping through a cursor, just do for variable in cursor. That's all you have to do. The database will automatically take care of converting that into array processing. You don't need bulk collect. You don't need to declare nested tables or associated arrays and stuff like that. You just change your cursor processing to for variable in cursor, and we automatically do array fetch size of 100. 
So that's all I've done. I've simply taken my low level API, which for a given product and customer just does now array processing on the sales rows. And I do the same thing with my actual anonymous block. Instead of opening a cursor, I do a for loop. Instead of opening a cursor, I do a for loop. That's all I've done. Let's see if we get any benefits. So I got some, I went down from what, 15 seconds because I'm still in commit every five seconds. Now I'm down to 10 seconds. Still, I'm getting what, three and a half times now performance benefit from my original code spec. And I've done minimal changes to the code and they're very, very low risk changes. Very easy to diagnose. Now, when it comes to doing bulk binding, once again, rather than rewriting all my code, I like taking advantage of the fact that we could intercept DML and do bulk binding as a separate activity. Once again, minimizing that risk. So how can I take a piece of code that always does insert commands and convert it to bulk binding without rewriting it? So I'm gonna build a little package here called pending rows. And because I'm doing bulk bind, I will need to define effectively an array type, but I've got this list of pending rows that need to be inserted. And all that's gonna happen here is when someone calls insert into sales low, I'm gonna pass in all the information that will be used to insert a row. But now let's look at the body and see what we really do. When someone says insert into sales low, I'm gonna simply take this row that's come in, sorry, the rows come in as individual parameters. I'm gonna turn it into a single row type variable. And then all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add it to my pending array. I'm gonna simply build up a list of outstanding row changes that need to be inserted. When that size gets more than a thousand, I'm gonna call a flush routine. The flush routine, the same package, simply does a for all, does a bulk bind insert, so it's inserting a thousand rows at a time as opposed to individual inserts, and then we delete the table again. Once again, all I need to do is go to my lowest level API, which used to be insert into sales low values, and change it to pending rows, insert into sales low. I should have put values in there, you'll almost be almost identical text. Once again, very, very low risk, because if this was a much more complicated routine, all I'm doing is intercepting where the DML occurs. Put it into my anonymous block. A couple of things I need to add. Once again, low risk at the end of it in case I've got any pending rows left over, flush them out and then a final commit as well. And I'm down to four seconds. So from 35 seconds down to 3.9 seconds, you know, putting my Oracle marketing hat on, you're verging on a 10x performance increase there, but you've chipped away at the code. All of this, based on this particular example, is looping through a source, doing an insert and calling a web service. And that web service returns a Boolean. If I was fully refactoring this code, I would take my very complicated web service, which returns a Boolean and put a wrapper function around it so it can return a Boolean to an integer because as it currently stands, you can't refer to a Boolean in SQL. That'll be fixed soon. Create a function that wraps around that. And then I could do this. This is really the same functionality. Go get all the products and customers, all the values with the sales is less than four, and the call to the web service returns one, do an insert with it, and there's the rows, and it took 0.2 of a second, which is obviously about 300 times faster than the 35 second example, and a lot faster than the four second example. However, the reason I didn't want to show this up front is in reality, if you go to your team lead, your project manager, whatever, and say, I've got a thousand lines of code. I think I can replace it with three or four different insert statements and update statements. Then that's going to create anxiety because there's the testing process involved. There's throwing away a lot of existing code, a lot of knowledge over the years that accumulates in code that often, often, you know, we often think of as garbage, but sometimes it's intrinsically valuable. Ultimately, what I'm saying is, is I like the idea of leaving existing code in there and chipping away at it because it minimizes the risk and gets you 90% of the way to the performance benefits of perhaps a native SQL solution. And probably the most uh, word of warning I come here is, is that it's so easy that when existing APIs exist out there, you say, ah, oh, there's an API to log a row, fine, I'll use that for my batch process. Ah, oh, there's an API that logs, loops through a single customer, I'll use that to loop through all customers. And that's a very uh, modular way of programming, but doesn't really suit SQL. So if I was rewriting it as SQL, that's fine. But if you want to take advantage of those APIs still, so you can say you're doing code reuse, look at opportunities of uh, making or of augmenting the code such that you can effectively insert 
array processing both in the query phase and the insertion phase without changing the fundamental logic of the program. Now, obviously I'm a SQL bigot, you know, I would say, if you can go SQL, then do it, but there are risks involved. And I said, but you don't have to sweat about it. These are these kind of things where you go from 35 seconds down to four seconds and some smart ass comes along and says, oh, you should have done it in SQL. Well, that's probably true, but if you, you know, if four seconds meets your response time, then be happy with it. You don't have to come up with a purest solution all the time. <laughs>